Hello, grade nine digital literacy students. Uh, welcome to a PowerPoint presentation uh, that the teachers have put together to describe to you what a digital footprint is um, and to kind of tee up the assignments that uh, we've laid out for you uh, this week. Hope you enjoy. To start us off, we've got a little video. Uh, so if you would like to press play on the video on this slide, that would be great. Okay, so what is a digital footprint? Um, well, the dictionary definition is a digital footprint is the collection of all the traces you leave in electronic environments as you use or move through them. So electronic environments being uh, social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and all of the many other uh, things that you can use, uh, things like YouTube, um, any online community like YouTube, there's there's thousands of them. Um, email, uh, text, uh, all of these things are, are digital environments. And they also include things that you sign up for, so memberships that you have, um, anything that you that you give personal information about when you're signing up for, is a place where you're leaving a digital footprint. Um, so you got to be careful about the social media posts that you have, the photos that you post, the YouTube videos that you upload, the comments that you make on all of those things, um, videos that other people take of you and put up on their platforms, um, the emails that you send to people uh, in general, but certainly people uh, who you have a, a professional affiliation with. Um, and uh, like I said, the texts and messages that you have. Um, another thing that a lot of people aren't uh, necessarily as aware about is this idea that, um, you know, you, you, you might search some things uh, on Google and then decide that you're going to delete your search history for whatever uh, reason um, and feel that that, that, that means that, uh, that nobody would ever know that you were uh, on those websites or that you were doing those things that you were doing online. Um, but there's this idea that uh, every internet connection that uh, that a house has or or a particular computer has uh, has an IP address, uh, and those things are searchable. So if you know if the Canadian government wanted uh, to uh, n know who is accessing a particular website at a particular time, uh, there are ways for them to get their hands on that information, and your IP address uh, could could give an organization with access, like the Canadian government, a picture of the types of things that you're doing online. Um, they might know who, you know, what kinds of organizations you uh, register for, memberships you have, uh, things that you have searched, websites that you have visited, um, and that can tell them a lot of information about you. Um, uh, so, so those are things to be really sort of careful with. So, one of the things that we're talking about is uh, what does it mean to have a positive digital uh, footprint? Uh, and to talk about that, uh, <laughs> uh, we can use the the ultimate offender of, uh, of not necessarily leaving a, a, a terribly diplomatic uh, digital footprint. Um, so we talked about social media, specifically in this case, we're talking about Twitter, um, but anything any, any, any of those platforms that we mentioned before, emails, YouTube, text, social media, um, those are things where you need to be a little bit careful about, about the kinds of things that you're saying, because the, the things that you're saying 
don't necessarily go away, and they have uh, they are accessible by a much larger audience than you might think. Um, so obviously, the president of the United States is a pretty big audience as it is, um, but through Twitter, he's sort of the first president that that has engaged in social media in the way that uh, that he has. Um, he's been doing it for a really long time. So these tweets are uh, from from back in the day when President Obama was the president, and and you know. He, Played some golf, uh, and Trump had these sort of comments to uh, to say about uh, about the president going out and golfing and criticisms. Um, and at that time, he probably didn't didn't necessarily think that he was going to be uh, running for president, let alone think that he was going to win the presidency. Um, so obviously, you can tell from reading the tweets, thought that Obama played a little bit too much golf, and that's fine, and that's a that's an opinion that he can have, right? It's not a it's not necessarily an incorrect opinion. Um, if you want to press play on that YouTube video, and uh, uh, it's just a, a funny video to check out. But as it turns out, uh, Donald Trump is now the president of the United States. And as it turns out, Donald Trump has many, many uh, golf resorts. And as it turns out, uh, Donald Trump really likes to play golf. Um, <laughs> So much so that there is a website dedicated to collecting st statistics about how much money <laughs> it has cost taxpayers in the United States for the rounds of golf that he has played and how many rounds of golf. And it compares a Obama and Trump in lots of different categories. So if you're interested in taking a look at that data, by all means, click the, uh, the link below. The point here isn't to bash Trump or anything like that, but the point is to kind of suggest that uh, the actions that President Trump took on Twitter uh, back in the day uh, are things that people can go back in history to kind of pull uh, to the forefront to, to sort of prove points that they have or to make somebody look bad or uh, to point out hypocrisy. And in this case, certainly very hypocritically, uh, Donald Trump criticized somebody for golfing at one point in his life on social media. And uh, he's now golfed a heck of a, heck of a lot more than, uh, <laughs> than Obama had at this point in his presidency. Um, and it's irrefutable. It's not something that you can kind of argue with. It's, it's sort of written down in internet fact, criticism in the left hand and fact uh, in terms of like paying attention to and collecting data in the right hand. Um, certainly pretty funny. Okay, so Donald Trump tweeting is kind of his uh, his vice, right? Those those things could potentially come back to haunt you, right? The words that you write. Um, this example is a little bit different. This is just a photograph, um, and I don't know if any of you know this story, but uh, in about 2012, uh, an employee, probably somebody in their teens, uh, like you guys, working at Burger King. Um, decided it was funny to, to walk on the lettuce with their shoes. Uh, and they took a photo of it, right? Not of their face. They didn't want to be identified. They just wanted to take the picture of the shoes on the lettuce uh, and then posted it saying something like, uh, this is what happens to the lettuce at Burger King. And from this one photograph, this is the original photograph. Uh, so the story goes, uh, people were able to gather enough information about uh, this person and where they were in order to figure out who this was and those people were uh were held responsible certainly they were fired but i but i would imagine that there was something uh more punitive that happened um i believe it was something like from the address on the box or uh from just looking at those shoes and, and looking at that floor that particular floor uh, they were able to figure out exactly what burger king establishment it was and from the shoes they were able to figure out uh, exactly which employee uh, that was, um, potentially also from the timestamp on the photograph, when it was taken, who was working on the shift. So there's tons of digital information that uh, that exists as a result of a digital photograph. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't personally be able to, to figure out from this photograph uh, what happened, but certainly some people with more knowledge than me uh, were able to do that. And so every single photo that you take uh, if somebody's motivated enough, they might be able to uh, identify you and uh, and identify what you're doing. So it's something to to think about. What's the underlying message? 
well, the underlying message is to be really careful about the things that you uh, that you post online because they could be hurtful to somebody else. Um, they could also come back to come back to bite you. Um, so managing your online presence is a is a really good idea. Okay, so the last uh, kind of thing that I wanted to mention was uh, was to sort of think a little bit about uh, how a digital conversation versus a regular conversation is different. Um, and you're all pretty smart people. You probably already uh, could sit down and list uh, a whole bunch of reasons why these these two types of conversations are different. Um, certainly, uh, one thing that gets that gets kind of introduced is punctuation. <laughs> so if you look at this, uh, I'm sure you've all seen this before. The commas save lives. Let's eat, Grandpa, versus Let's eat, Grandpa. Um, so what, as soon as you're writing instead of speaking. Um, then the meaning behind what you're saying could potentially be misconstrued. Um, it's possible that the context of what you're saying could be misconstrued. Um, historically, being able to accurately convey emotion via text, via writing, uh, is actually really challenging, uh, especially when you don't have a lot of context. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons why emojis uh, came to be. It's because, you know, in in a digital environment, people wanted to be able to convey their emotion. Um, when I said those words, was I saying them angrily or was I saying them happily? Was I trying to be funny? Those are all things that kind of disappear when you're texting as opposed to speaking. Um, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that the meaning of what you're trying to say is often misconstrued in a text. And I'm sure you've all had uh, an experience uh, like that before. Um, and so thinking about the things that you just kind of fire off quickly in a text and how those can be misconstrued. And in the future, again, going back to the Donald Trump example, like if you wanted to be prime minister of Canada, if you wanted to be the CEO of a company, if you wanted to be uh, you know, a teacher of some kind, is it possible that the text that you're sending could be taken out of context? Is it possible that the exact words that you put down on paper when read through somebody else's brain without knowing what the what the context of the situation was, um, is it possible that that could get you into trouble or that somebody might think differently about you than what you are? Um, because the text conversations that you have almost certainly are being stored uh, somewhere. Um, you can delete them from your phone, but but there there is a record of those conversations somewhere. Um, and you want to make sure that the things that you're writing are, uh, are things that you would stand behind um, if, uh, if your teachers saw them or if your parents saw them or if your grandparents saw them or whatever. Um, and I think that's about it. Hello, everybody. It's Mr. Beely. So Mr. Salabri has told us about what a digital footprint is and how online interactions are different from in-person interactions. Now it's time to start considering what that means for us when we start posting online. Now, the phrase you're seeing on this slide here is not meant to make you feel afraid about posting on the internet, but it's intended to make you consider that everything that you put online, you should always feel like it's gonna be there forever because in truth, the internet never forgets. The things that you post online, once you have submitted it and made it public to other people, you have to act with the assumption that that is going to be there forever and it can be retrieved at any time. So even the things that you're posting now in grade nine or younger, later in your life, there's nothing to say that those are those cannot resurface and you want to make sure that they're going to be things that you're proud of. We don't have to look very far in the news to find examples of people immediately regretting things that they had posted uh, earlier in their life or just posting without really thinking of the consequences. So here's an example from a couple years ago of a woman who got a internship at NASA, which is just an absolutely massive achievement. And she was really excited about it. And she decided to tweet about it with some colorful language. When someone uh, commented language to her, she responded in a way that was not so polite and then she found out that that person who had originally messaged her was on the National Space Council that managed those internships at NASA. And this girl actually lost her internship. 
Luckily, uh, she was able to get her internship back only because Mr. Hickam, the, pers the second person in this tweet, actively asked NASA to reinstate her internship. But in this example, which luckily has a happy ending, we can see how even a moment of careless posting can wash away years of effort. So now that we know the importance of maintaining a positive digital footprint and always being conscious of the things we're putting online, we have to ask ourselves who can or and who wants to view our digital footprint. And it goes much farther than you might think. It's not just the people in your social circles that you might that might be interested in looking up on it. Uh, in 2018, an article from CNBC found that from 2006, there were just 12% of hiring managers who were using social media accounts as a screening tool. By 2010, that figure had grown to 25% and now stands at 70%. So what this means is that now 70% of employers or hiring managers are, using, are looking at social media to determine, at least in part, who they do and who they do not hire. The last few slides may have given you the impression that we shouldn't be online or that we shouldn't be posting or that we should have a non-existent digital footprint. But I wanna stress that that's not the case. Instead, we wanna make sure that we are building visible digital footprints that show us at our best. On this slide, we have a series of examples of the kinds of social media content that help employers choose employees. The kinds of things that they're looking for include things like demonstration of skills and qualifications in your social media content, uh, examples of candidates being creative or having a professional image or having a wide range of interests. Your employers, they're going to want to be able to get an idea of who you are as a person from your social media and make sure that you're right for the company. So the idea is not that we stop posting or we don't have a digital footprint. It's that we make sure that we're posting the things that make us look as good as possible. If we understand the importance of having a positive digital footprint, that's all fine and good. But how do you know if what you're going to post is going to be something that is going to leave a positive digital footprint? A good set of criteria to uh, refer to is what we call think. So before you post or share or message online, always ask yourself, is what I'm posting true? Is it what I'm posting hurtful? Is it illegal? Is it necessary? And is it kind? If you go through these criteria and you can make sure that it is true, it's not hurtful or illegal, and that it is necessary and kind, you can make sure that what you're posting online is productive and it's going to be positive and beneficial for other people and thus something that you're going to be proud of when you look back on it. Thank you, Mr. Bealy. So always remember that anything that you post online across all platforms, whether it be your personal blogs, social media accounts, or even over teams in your classes, is taken as a digital representation of yourself as an individual. Your online presence and behavior is totally intertwined with the real world. So keeping that in mind, here are some tips for creating a positive digital footprint. So always use the acronym THINK that Mr. Bealy just covered. Okay, and then in more detail, never post anything that you might find embarrassing later. Be careful with the pictures you post on your public profiles. And remember, others will see them and judge you based on their content. Okay, do not disclose any of your personal uh, information, whether it be address, phone number, passwords, bank cards. And that really ties into checking your privacy, set, privacy settings on your social networking sites because you don't actually know who's on that other profile that you might have as a friend, okay? Also, always don't post anything to hurt anyone, okay? We wanna be kind, we wanna care for others. And again, keep in mind that if you post something, it's not just gonna go away. One of the main goals of digital literacy is for you to begin creating a positive digital footprint for yourself that goes beyond your presence on social media platforms. So we are going to get you to create a blog website on the platform called Edublogs. So you're gonna utilize your Edublog account as 
a presentation portfolio where you're going to be able to accumulate all the really interesting and cool things that you're doing at Glen Eagle throughout your four years here to demonstrate your growth all the way from when you started in grade nine to when you finish in grade 12. This is really important because a lot of um, employers and universities are actually looking at these types of portfolios as part of their entrance criteria that go beyond trying to get into schools like Emily Carr that are kind of arts based. So your first thing you're going to do to get it started is to create a blog post and it's going to be a reflection of your digital footprint. So we're going to teach you how to create the blog. We are going to teach you to um, maintain it. And all of the instructions for this first assignment can be found on your digital literacy team under the assignments tab. So these Edublog accounts that you're going to be creating today are actually public facing portfolios, meaning anybody in the community can actually view them. So when you're creating your website today, we want you to keep three things in mind. Number one, do not post your last name anywhere on your website. Number two, do not post your school, so Glen Eagle, or any information about where you live. And number three, do not post any photos of you, your family, or your friends. When you're completely finished creating your first blog post and your About Me page, you are going to submit this assignment by going to Microsoft Teams and selecting, obviously, the Digital Literacy Team. From there, click on Assignments, then click on the Digital Footprint Assignment. What you want to do is actually attach a link to your completed website and hit Submit. All the instructions on how to complete this assignment are going to be found through the Tech 101 site. You can actually access that through the assignments itself on the team. So to get you started, you want to go to mygleneagle.sd43.bc.ca. And just a reminder that you don't want to be clicking on get a blog. You want to click on, in the top left corner of the screen, the login button. From there, you will type in your 125 dash uh, at sd43.bc.ca email address and then the password that's been given to you. That will automatically generate your blog where you can get started. We're really looking forward to reading over your blogs and seeing uh, your reflections on your digital footprints. Good luck, and if you need help, please feel free to reach out to us through Teams or in the Nest in the Library.